what does it take to be a solo developer? Those rare unicorns of the indie game world who do all the art, programming, music writing, and game design themselves. It's certainly not impossible, and is becoming increasingly common. If you've ever wanted to peek behind the curtain of how one of these developers operates and creates, then look no further. My name's Graham and welcome to Two Left Thumbs. In a lengthy chat with Jake Friend, solo developer of the upcoming Scrabdackle, links in the description for the Kickstarter coming March 16th, I got to learn about how this game took shape and his specific design philosophies that have resulted in this singular vision for a game. Here's a quick elevator pitch on that project. Hello, I'm Jake, also known as Jake Friend. I'm the developer of Scrabdackle. I've been a game developer as a hobby for close to 15 years now. It's about half my life. And Scrabdackle's a game about going exploring. You are a a lost wizard who doesn't know the world because you've never left your academy and you go adventuring around the world trying to get home while getting to know it sort of for the first time. There's some Metroidvania-like ability progression. It is non-linear. There's a lot of big bosses and funny little conversations and I hope for it to be a kind of exciting and very engaging experience. I think learning about a singular game in depth helps provide a lot of context and I think for both seasoned and hopeful new developers there is a lot of wisdom here. What does Jake view as their specific strengths and talents? Balance. Which softwares and systems does he recommend? Who specifically influenced him in all aspects of creation? What does he view as the pros and cons of working alone? And to cap it off, a selection of what I found to be the most commonly asked questions for solo developers, including things like how to get started and how to stay motivated. Let's open things up by inquiring how the main story unfolds in a non-linear game. There's a couple story beats that will be mandatory, but you don't have to experience the story mandatorily. There is a sort of a starting goal of, okay, I fell out of the Wizard Academy, I want to get back, I'm going to try and get back, and you can do whatever you want, but as soon as you try and go there and you realize you don't have the tools, your goal becomes explore until I have the right tools. And once you get there, you know, there'll be a story beat, but it's not the end of the game or anything like that. At that point, the scope of the story shifts from get to the Wizard Academy to this sort of larger thing that encompasses a bit of a bigger quest. And more specifically, how does the world begin to open up to allow for that intended player freedom? Any major boss will have its own small story that relates to one of them, and you'll get boss gems, basically, when you beat them. And you might have access to five or six bosses from the very start of the game. But as soon as you have three of them, you can go to this sort of end game place, and it'll open up another chunk of areas and start to give you more abilities that let you go back and forth from those areas more organically. And then once you've got, you know, another six or seven of these boss gems, but this time out of a collection of, you know, 11 or 12 bosses, you can unlock another major part of the world map. You might only have to fight maybe 12 bosses to access the final boss out of the 20 or so bosses that I hope to be in the game. Which ones that you fight in what order is pretty much up to you. You just need to have a bare minimum that you do fight to access that. You'll experience bits of stories along the way, and there's a character who does sell you some of these at a high price that kind of lowers that bar for having to fight things to explore a bit more. So I hope for there to be a lot of replayability of like, I only got one ability, then I bought a gem, then I went to the second area, and I got that ability and I came back, like that kind of thing. Obviously games don't spontaneously come into being. I'm curious about the history of how the world of Scrabdackle came to be. A couple of years ago, I was working with my roommate of a long time, and the idea was basically this boss battle game where you go into these eight kids' dreams and fight their nightmares. It was called Dream Wizards, and that's the entire gameplay. It's just you fight any bosses in any order, and we went with Wizards just because it was kind of neat. We just needed something for the player to be. And I just thought the art style, which we had picked to be very quick and easy to do, was a lot of fun and very intriguing. So I just started to run with it on my own, trying to see if I could complete it as a non-multiplayer kind of game, and I just started getting interested in what was connecting these scenes. We were putting a lot of personality into each of these kind of quote-unquote dream boss arenas. I got really attached to, okay, well there's this really cool mountaintop, and like, is that connected to the rest of the world? So I started coming up with this concept of like, well maybe you'll explore just a little bit, and the more that I worked on it, the more that I just got interested in the world itself. It started very linear, and I just found myself adding little bits and pieces to it. I didn't really plan on having much dialogue or story. I wasn't sure there would be any dialogue, but the early feedback that came in was, you know, this is really fun, I like the characters, I think the world is interesting, and that just drew me into focusing a lot more on the world and character designs and personalities. There's seemingly a really clear connection and analogy for the game here, that you made a game about exploration and discovery by exploring the potential within your own game. 
Yeah, it's it's funny that almost the reason I started to turn it into a, a more of a world exploration type game is kind of just because I found the art and aesthetic and environment very compelling for some reason, and that ended up being the same thing that my players found more compelling. So I've really let myself be drawn into this kind of communal direction of, this is a neat world, sure it can have bosses, sure it can have gameplay, but this is like a fun place that I'm interested in. Starting out as a boss battle game, how do you now approach the boss battles in this larger world of Scrabdackle? Something that I really dislike in games, me and my friend used to play a lot of the original Mega Man games, and whenever we got to bosses like Robot Masters, he would like get really good at dodging the attacks and counterattacking and take down the Robot Master, and I would equip either a good weapon or just spam my blaster and pretty much go against the game design and just tank the hits and try and like, you know, kill you before you kill me and survive with like one health every time. And I didn't like doing it, it just... The game let me, and I felt like sometimes it was like, well, you don't care, I don't care. If the design is supposed to be like, learn this pattern, get familiar, and everything is designed with a way to dodge or counter or a tell that you can learn, then you shouldn't need much health because the game should be all about not having too much of a threshold or mistakes and supporting you to try again very quickly. The purpose of the fight should be getting good at the fight so that it feels satisfying to win by actually having gotten good at it and it having it actually be a, a challenge that that you could not just tank your way through. So I've had people reach out to say, you know, some people found the first boss fight quite punishing, and I do want to have some like assist sliders and, and settings that I haven't implemented yet. So there will be some things like scaling boss health percentages, and there's even a mode right now where instead of taking damage, you are invincible, but your magic meter drops and you can't fight back for a moment. But I want the game to be like, you know, these attacks are simple and you need to get familiar at, with them. You need to understand when this boss, you know, grins for a moment while spinning their staff that they're about to fly towards you and you should get out of the way, but there's a great opportunity to counterattack as soon as this attack finishes. Things like that. Taking a game that originally had no story, how have you gone about building and expanding the story of Scrabdackle? I mean, I, I'm ruminating on it more, and I think that there is a genuine love of well-done subversion that I find satisfying in creating you know, stories and things like that where you're not necessarily a hero or a heroic person, you just happen to be there and the game doesn't lodge you with titles and prophecies and stuff that I find is very much a crutch. I do a lot of tabletop RPGs, and I've been running a, I don't know, five-year-long D&D campaign at a homebrew world with some friends. I really enjoy a story that takes something simple and does something interesting with it, and sometimes flips something on its head. I think there's a part of me that just sees people wanting to try and do something, and I want them to kind of be able to, especially if it's interesting. If it is interesting, I will follow whatever direction that thread is going. And often that is definitely not the first thing you think of, probably not the second or third or fourth thing. Usually the first things you think of are like, I'm going to go to this castle and fight the enemy and you know now I'm playing with that idea and I'm more interested in the behaviors at this castle and the idea of like public image <laughs> being part of this big castle duel story and the state of certain prisoners and their motivations and things like that. I think we now have a very strong overview of what to expect in terms of gameplay, exploration, progression, boss battles, and storytelling. Let's take a deeper look at your design philosophies, how those permeate this world, and how they really work to sell us on the larger picture of your intended experience playing Scrabdackle. Maybe you could start by expanding on some of that non-linearity? I've got a tutorial area called the Junk Heap. You found your wand as the first goal you're given, which happens very quickly. You're able to destroy some junk piles that let you leave and explore. You don't have to go to area A where you get the ability that lets you explore to area B, which lets you explore to area C. A lot of abilities will open similar pathways in a way where you might have to get an ability before you can get to a certain area, but you can take any one of three. But you could end up into the Ducklands area, which is this really big, large plain ruled by this kind of aggressive warlike duck kingdom almost, you could go from there to the Wizard Academy, or from there to this other mysterious tower, or from there to the Duck Castle, which is a full dungeon, or from there to a different area, these high mountains and canyons. Not even go to the Ducklands at all, and go into this slightly more dangerous ruins area. It's going to open up quite a lot from the beginning. I hope it makes for a lot of replayability. And there's some risk because now you are risking some players will not find all of your content. And I think that's what a lot of AAA games are very afraid of. Like, we built this content, you should not be able to miss content. When you're working on a smaller project and you can take more risks in your approach, I, I think if you want to have exploration be fun and exciting and secrets be fun and exciting, you have to be willing to have not everyone find everything. We know that exploration is a big part of this game, collecting information and filling out the in-game lore book with the scribe function, but how do you handle secrets hidden throughout the world? When I decided to add secrets to the game, I sat down and wrote out, like, I want exploration to be 
fun and engaging and genuine. How do I achieve that? And made a bunch of notes about like, you have to be the one exploring. There have to be things worth finding when you explore. So there has to be you know, something that exists as a reward, even if it's just player recognition and working backwards from there. And one of the most critical things before I decided to put these secret stars in the game is thinking back to like Celeste. What I love about the secrets, the, like, the strawberries in Celeste is that you never just happen to grab one. Sometimes they're in plain sight and they're tricky to get, and you might have to figure out how you even platform to get it. But sometimes it's like, oh, you notice something, you notice there might be a fake wall there, and what's behind that fake wall is another challenge room. It's not just like a strawberry is there in a kind of, you know, Mario Odyssey, check this bush, you got a moon sort of way. It's like your reward for noticing something is getting to do another challenge. So every secret that I want to put into Scrap Dackle ideally is associated with something you still have to do that is past. Just notice this, even if it's as simple as like there's two garbage can enemies shooting at you. How do you go about telegraphing secrets to the player, especially to get them first started on secret hunting? In terms of like how you teach players to look for secrets, there's a little bit of leading that you need to do. That's part of what the tutorial area is about. I think most people will walk past one of the first secret stars that is immediately south of the starting position that you could pick up you know, within 10 seconds on a new game. Because as far as you know, there's nothing saying, hey, there's a big secret here, or even, hey, there's a lot of secrets in this game. But as you walk around the starting area, there are some spots here and there that make you start to wonder if there are secrets. You know, there's a moment where I've got this tiny little hallway with a couple more or less harmless enemies in it. And there's a lot of level design that makes you just think like, it kind of looks like there's something to walk towards here. And when you do, it's like, da 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 and the, <laughs> the, the false ceiling fades away. And that makes you think there must be more of this around. Now you're looking for it a little bit. You know, every secret that I've got in this game has a tell somewhere around it that indicates where it is. You might not recognize it as a tell right Right away it might be quite subtle but you know you have a challenge where there's this room filled with a bunch of tiny harmless enemies and it's just kind of neat to just shoot them all like everyone who goes through this room ends up doing it and then a challenge starts because you have you know angered the dust moat gods or whatever but there's really not much even in the original version of the demo there was nothing that indicated that was there now there's some characters who talk about like you know there's a big dust moat infestation deeper in the caves but they still don't really say like do something about it clear it out or anything it just kind of implies like this is worth taking note of and what you end up doing with that is is still very much up to you. In what ways will you as a character grow and improve while working through the game, defeating bosses and discovering secrets? And just on a personal level, I don't like rewards that are, now your number is a little bit better. That can work great in a game like Risk of Rain, where it's all about <laughs> breaking the game over time through large accumulation of minute percentage increases. But for something like this, you know, one of the only things I didn't enjoy about Hollow Knight is you get your nail upgrades, your weapon upgrades, and you do you know, something like twice as much damage or 60% you know, more damage, and that's okay, but you can upgrade another like two or three times after that. And there's a point where like you don't really have to worry about the combat as much because you are just a god. You will just walk around smashing things into dust. And I think that's too powerful. I would prefer instead of giving players power increases vertically, I would rather horizontally give them power options. So most of the abilities you get in the game aren't necessarily going to be stronger than your initial attack, but they'll open up different ways to attack or different combat styles that are valid that might have certain ups and downs in different situations. Or maybe this one is stronger, but it's slower to attack with or drains more magic. So you really want to wait for that perfect moment to drop like a lightning bolt down or whatever it is. It opens up some interesting you know, design challenges and stuff too. I don't want to have that Breath of the Wild situation where because you have the same abilities the entire game, the difficulty is still low no matter where you go. So much as like, you can still require certain things and be challenging as long as you've made sure the player has that equipment with them. So I might have a fight that is all designed around sword play and counter sword play. I will just make sure that you have the sword-like weapon before you get there. I let you get to the Wizard Academy at earliest as the second major area that you could tackle. It's meant to be a little more mid-game, but you could do one area and go straight there and have your basic wand attack and one other attack that you picked up to unlock the area. You will be able to have a very hard boss fight, but I have to design it so that it is possible for the player to win with any single one of these three valid ways to access that area, which is cool. It's challenging, but it's cool. <laughs> player wants to go do something. My design philosophy is like, cool, have at it. I'm not going to stop you with cutscenes or broken bridges or whatever. Speaking of that player freedom, Scrabdackle has this unique system of conversation engagement. How did this leave any time dialogue system come about? And what are some of the challenges that come with that? 
I just want the player to have as much control as I can. There's been some very difficult design challenges. If you have a screen where you can walk up to a character and, you know, they talk to you a little bit and you walk away when you're good, that can be very enjoyable to a player. But there can also be these moments of like, well, if they're not locked in, there's all of these edge cases for things that could happen. Like the way that I've been writing dialogue, I had to kind of build this side tool to do it because if you're meeting a character, the initial conversation, you go up to them, you talk to them, it might be like, Ah, who are you? Oh, I don't know. Oh, I'm kind of about this. Are you interested in this? Oh, hello, little wizard. And then they'll sort of slowly work towards the end point of the conversation, which is, I will sell you this cool thing for a lot of money. But there are a lot of moments where you walk away from this conversation, and what the character says when you leave has to reflect how far you have made it through that conversation. And when you come back, they might say something different, like, now they know who you are, even if they haven't introduced themselves as a vendor. So there's sort of this like series of flags that gets tripped, and each series of flags usually has their own approach or walk away dialogue. This particular character I'm talking about, the snake, has a whole series of dialogues for if you approach them without a wand at all, you have no way to get money. And if you have no money, they're not interested in you and they'll tell you to go find the wand. But you know, you might come back having talked with them about that, but still don't know they're a vendor. And it's become a little bit crazy. It's it's cool when it works, but it's, it's a little wild to think through. There are some characters who, if you walk away, they might like assign a rude flag to you and be a little snippier when you come back. Or uh, if you walk away, sort of like cry out for your attention or something to that effect. Yeah, I think the majority of games lock you in at least to the first conversation where you're introduced. And at that point, you can choose to walk away or ask more or whatever. But when you come back, it just goes to the welcome back. You already know I'm a vendor. You know who I am. And if the writing doesn't feel accurate to that experience, then I've kind of damaged this heavy emphasis on world building character that I've been trying to pull off. Another standout system that I've seen take shape from the first demo to now is the totally reworked health bar. Can you explain that evolution and shed some light on the new corking system? The way that it currently stands is you've got a set of five vials with you know pink potion in it that basically represents your health. You can take half a potion's worth of damage from something small, and the potions kind of uncork as you go, but they do not recork as you pick up small bits of health. Only when you save the game and totally refresh your health do the corks go back in. What I had started with going back to Dream Wizards was like four colors of wizard, and they each had their own potion color, and that was their health for this little local multiplayer thing. And the potion bottle drained as you took damage, and then smashed when you uh, ran out of health and had kind of the smoking remains of the uh, the burnt potion bit there. And the first thing I did when I was working on the demo was basically just copy that over. I knew I wanted a small amount of max health and it felt fine to have a potion where potion full, health is full, potion you know down a couple chunks, you've taken a few hits. It, it felt in my head very clear before I had played it out. But a lot of problems showed up you know fairly quickly, mainly being that you couldn't really easily eyeball what your health was or if you were in danger because three-fifths and two-fifths in a swirling potion bottle <laughs> looked very similar. So I had to have a number on it and then I realized people were just looking at the number. I want the player to think of potions and not nine out of ten. So I needed a way to abstract that clearly where it's still better delineated along the equivalent of your health bar. So this was an idea I had really early on. I wanted to find ways of kind of rewarding the player for being like skilled and pulling off like really impressive stuff, not getting hit, things like that. And you know, the entire combat design is the idea is that in theory, you should not be taking any hits. If you're really practiced, you know what you're doing, you're familiar with the tells, it should be possible to not get hit at all. Maybe, maybe very hard, but possible. I really like the system that did not punish players for not being able to do this, but does kind of give you like this visual reward if you are streaming or you've recorded to YouTube or you're showing a friend that you finish the fight with all of the corks in place. So at the end of the fight, it doesn't matter where your health is at, the corks tells the story of your kind of low health watermark of how rough did it get, how, how close of a fight was it. And if you have all your corks, you're untouchable. You didn't take a single hit. And if you have, you know, one cork left, it's like, whoa, yeah, I picked up some health at the end, but that was really close. Like it came down. Maybe you have no corks. Maybe you came down to half a potion's worth of damage left. But I've got lots of options I can do with this. I can have, you know, achievements if you can complete a battle uncorked or corked or whatever the, without any corks being popped. This is something an Untitled Story had. It's a game by Maddie Thorson from like 2004 four or five, there were a billion health upgrades in that game, and you could become, you know, real chunky, real impervious to damage if you went and explored. And I think the game design was not expecting you to 100% it. One of the things that having all of these upgrades does is if you do go and get them all, it's kind of not fun to bulk your way through a challenge and you run into that Mega Man problem of like, well, if I can tank this fight, I might just do that and it'll be less fun for me, but I'll still do it. So an Untitled Story has, I think they're called heart doors. These are little challenge doors that only open when your health is at max when you get there. It doesn't matter what that maximum is. So you'll find like, might only be a two room platforming challenge where there's a safe
save point that heals you at the start of it, but you have to learn how to do that perfectly to be able to pass through this door. And there's a lot of secrets and a few like very late game, especially hard areas that are locked off this way. And I think that's brilliant. Like I think that is so smart because it lets players have as much kind of difficulty buffer as they want for certain parts of the game. And if you really need to be like, nuh-uh, this time you have to get good, you have an option to do that that's built into the game. So I could easily have a, a cork door and I could do the same thing where like, now this reward is optional. It doesn't You don't have to get it. And you're totally able to, you know, get hit in this section and heal and move on. But if you want this special, special thing, you need to do this perfectly, so it's up to you. While this video is largely made in relation to Scrabdackle, the hook is still to learn more about the perspective of a solo game developer. As someone who wears so many hats, which is the aspect of development you view as being your greatest skill? It's funny that I'm probably a musician first. I've been playing music most of my life, but I've also always enjoyed doodling, and I've also always enjoyed story writing and kind of creating experiences for people. When I started doing development, it was mostly not as a programmer and letting my, my partner work on all of that, but when he and I would talk through, I would usually be leading a lot of the design conversations. Yeah, in a strange way, even though I think the game is known for its art more than anything else, I think musician is kind of my oldest hat almost. I'm pretty sure I learned piano first, but I'm primarily a guitar player. Variety of styles, self-taught, can play a variety of percussion, harmonica, bass. I was learning banjo and violin at one point. I definitely don't know any of that anymore. And I do a little bit of singing, but quite badly, so not frequently. Playing instruments versus composition are presumably quite different. How did you bridge that particular gap? My theory background for music is, is very, very weak. I was talking with a developer friend who was kind of talking about he's getting into composition, how did I get into game composition, and you know, I don't even know what key I'm working in most of the time. I'm just going with, <laughs> like, I, I think it needs to go this way, and it's going to go that way, and it just pulls together in the end. Are you leaning on some of those musical talents? Utilizing the ability to actually play instruments and recording any of the music live? It's 100% digital. I've done plenty of live music recording in the past, but it's not a aesthetic that I'm going for with this game. I'm basically using a piece of software called PT Collage, which was built by Pixel, who was the developer of Cave Story, did the music for Cave Story with this tool that he built himself, which is still wild when I think about it. It's a bit dated now. It's a little too old and missing some quality of life features for me to properly recommend it, but I've been using it for about 10 years, and when I want something that feels a little bit more old school and chiptune-y, that's what I go back to. Notes last the exact amount of time of an eighth note or a fourth note that I need. There's no imprecision about it, and that's very deliberate. No velocity considerations or anything like that. I'm not playing a digital keyboard. I'm clicking my notes in where they need to be, really. To give inquisitive viewers some extra valuable info, you know, if they plan to utilize any of these softwares themselves, what sound libraries are you using? I'm using this big collection of sound libraries that was released with it. It's a free, I believe, donationware piece of software that for quite a while was pretty popular and there were a lot of little free sound fonts available with it. Most of the stuff I'm using are kind of emulating real instruments. So Scrabdeckle has a lot of sounds that are like, you know, reminiscent of brass, reminiscent of sometimes flutes or, or strings and things like that, as well as your classic percussion that's that's very much like this old 8-bit like kind of thing. Yeah, it's just mixed in with uh, a little bit of echoes and delays when I need something to sound a little bit more spacey or haunting, but it's uh, it's ultimately just a, a chiptune program where I'm trying to make things that remind me of those old experiences of playing these old Game Boy games where the worlds were huge and it felt like anything was kind of possible. <laughs> While we're on the train of softwares being used, how did you land on Godot as your game engine of choice? I've been using Godot for not quite a year, actually. I picked it up when my friend was working in it and suggested that I give it a try because it was uh, free and open source and there was sort of no harm. I didn't really have a lot of confidence as a programmer. I have done some other programming work, non-game related stuff in my life. I think because I had a lot of friends who were very heavy into computer science and things like that, I almost thought it was like not my territory to go into. So the rare times that I would be working by myself on something and handling the programming, I would be working in these visual programming type tools like Construct and things like that. You know, it's good for learning. Honestly, I think Construct is really good for prototyping, but it's not good for a full-size game or scaling. And there's a lot of ways that once you know what you're doing, you're, you're holding one arm behind your back when you're trying to work. And I just thought that, you know, that was all I 
could do, and I, I, I wouldn't be able to learn programming because my genius computer wizard friends who had all this background with these intense comp sci courses, you know, if they could do it, how could I do it? But I'd been frustrated with my last project where I wanted it to be something larger, and I was really constrained by the engine. I really like working in 2D, and I had heard that Unity isn't really great for 2D, it's much more a 3D-oriented engine. And I thought, yeah, sure, I'll give Godot a try, it's free. I'll just put this old project back together just to get familiar with it, and um, then figure out what I want to do from there. And for like a week, it was like me getting familiar and trying to recreate Dream Wizards. And suddenly it was like, this is really great. This is really easy to, uh, to pick up. I'm not having any troubles programming in the software. The way that they structure their code is really different from other engines, and I think very easy for me to understand. So I just ran with it, and before I knew it, I've got this basically much larger than it ever was before project that's come a long way from this initial boss battle game. And I'm thinking about, you know, maybe I should release some kind of demo for this. Maybe I should actually uh, put it out there and call it its own thing and, and run with this as a longer term project. Are you creating all the artwork in engine? I'm doing the art externally. I'm doing it in a sprite, which is a fantastic tool for pixel art, especially for animating that I highly recommend. It's quite cheap. I don't mind working in that tool and exporting and bringing that into Godot. Godot's got a really quick process of, I can just export directly into that file folder and Godot will replace the art that I'm using with the new version of that file that I've saved. But I have worked with uh, engines in the past where they do have their own like sprite editor built in and I don't think it's worth it really to go with an engine just for that reason. If it's got a clean and simple way to bring art into the engine. A lot of game dev does involve kind of trying to tie a pipeline of different tools together, and this one does it pretty easily. Um, if I want to tweak an animation, as long as I'm not inserting new frames, I can just update those old frames and that sprite sheet will be pulled in and the animation's good to go. How do you perceive your own art style and how it fits into the world of Scrabdackle? It's really interesting that I do have a very specific style, and I have tried playing around with it a little bit to get a clearer sense of, well, yes, it's a scribbly style, but how do I get to be more dialed in on what works and what doesn't? What's really tempting for me as an admitted perfectionist is, you know, I'll draw a line and it'll be imperfect, and I will want to smooth it out. And from the more traditional pixel art I've done in my time, I know how to get that looking really smooth. But as soon as I do, it takes away a lot of the character. It has to stay visually imperfect and scribbly. Knowing that has been really helpful because it lets me be a little bit freer with my lines and things like that. Like I'll do one pass that's just a rough thing where I lay out the shapes of the character and try and figure out if the scale is working and then I'll try and draw over that but I do still draw really quickly and try not to tweak something unless it really has to be tweaked to make something visually clear. The messiness is a really critical part to connecting with it and every time I smooth something out I can feel it's just like a little bit more soulless and it's harder to engage with. Do you have any tricks for getting the most out of this more minimalist style? The, the expressions in the character are like, they're very simple. They kind of make the characters look a little bit dumb, which is fun because there's so much that the player can mentally add onto that while still giving you like a base to work with. You can do so much with characters that look just a little bit dumb because they can surprise you by being witty. They can get players to be you know, like a little bit like annoyed or frustrating sometimes. Uh, I love having characters that are just a little bit too stubborn and a little bit in your way and unwilling to listen to what you have to say or preoccupied with their own thoughts. It can sometimes be a little difficult to pin down who influenced our artistic, comedic, musical, or really any other creative endeavor. I imagine it becomes all the more difficult when you do it all, but hopefully you could walk me through who you view as your biggest creative influences, starting with musical stylings? I'm definitely pursuing a certain style, and I think it almost goes back to, for the more exploration-based tracks, kind of that classic Game Boy era of, like, you have your Link's Awakening, Oracle of Seasons, Oracle of Ages. Those games did a really good job alternating between some bigger tracks that were kind of constantly playing and driving you forward a little bit, but also these eerier, slower exploration tracks where the music kind of comes in and pauses and just lets you sit for a moment and then comes back in and it's very delicate and non-intrusive. As well as things like Wario Land 2, Wario Land 3, where there's kind of this silliness or, or quirkiness that uh, really informs you what kind of world it is. This is eerie, this is serious, but still kooky. And I, I really like that. Heavy inspirations musically for the game. How about artistic? Something that's kind of funny here is I didn't really think I had any influences, but the other day I was going through some old stuff that I hadn't looked at in, in years and years, some of the archives of MS Paint Adventures. There's so much more influence of the 
problem sleuth style of art from back when Andrew Hussey was doing that before um, it became much more like involved and serious art of the, the things that happened later. I had no idea how subconsciously that had influenced me, but when I look back, it's like, oh yeah, oh yeah, I see that. I see that in the expressions. I see that in the scribbly but serious style. It's, uh, you know, it's not exactly the same, but you have very simple facial expressions, very simple, but kind of interesting shaped body shapes, a little bit of stick limbs for when things need to be expressive. This is more abstract, but are there any seminal games or gaming experiences that influenced how you craft the exploration in game and delivering those secrets? Oh, there's a lot to get into here. I definitely have some really strong influences on that feeling of exploration. Like going back to the original Link's Awakening, which is absolutely such an influential title on me overall. The fact that you have to repeatedly traverse different areas and kind of see things that you think you should be able to get to, but you can't quite. And like coming back and trying again until you can make it there. There's some degree of rewarding of like you can see something that you're not sure how to get to, but you know eventually you will, where you kind of want to keep trying again and like keep thinking about it and eventually, wow, now you've explored this entire mountain range that took five tries of different explorations to get through. There's things like uh, an untitled story. It's this very scribbly MS Paint, like you know, the graphics are bad, the music is bad, but it's so full of like love and personality and character and you basically just start off as this tiny egg and go exploring as much as you can and get a few abilities and all of a sudden this massive world has opened up and there are things like I wonder if I go to the highest point in the world and I jump and I hold left as much as I can if there's something I can fall to that I couldn't get to before you try it and all of a sudden just for a moment you pass through this area that looks like a giant floating pyramid or something and it's like what what was that that's crazy and you can't really get into it but now you know it's there and you realize you've seen a save statue as you passed by and you can teleport to any save statue that you can see. So you try teleporting to it and bam, now you've found this giant sky pyramid and it's an entire dungeon. It's, it, it's so rewarding to kind of wonder and then test that wonder and find something. And I know that like every game is influenced by Hollow Knight and that makes sense because there is something to the feeling of like, I think this is the bottom of the world and there's an area below that and there's an area below that and there's an area below that and hiding an entire area, it technically it's something that players could miss. And there's some clever level design that encourages you to quote unquote accidentally find it. But you always feel like you're the one who found it because they never told you to go there or told you how to access it. But it's like all on you to explore and discover for yourself. I have a few questions that I think might provide some insight into what it means to work as a solo developer before moving into that list of most common questions. First off, do you still feel the need to write out a full design document when the game is all coming from your own head? I used to write a lot of design docs when I was younger and I just had a lot of spare time and I didn't think I could make something myself, but I could design it. And I would write down all of these details for, here's what the gameplay is like, here's how much health things have. It would, it would get into a lot of detail, like here's sketch maps of the world, things like that. I've basically given up on design documents as a individual. I'd want to use one if I was working with a team, but I'm iterating really quickly. I have a strong sense of what the final vision should feel like and the general size and scope of it. And I don't want to keep writing things that will be constantly needed to be updated or fall out of date. Like initially, exploration was not really a part of the game. And to go back and update a design document that would have 100% been about combat and bosses and you go from here to here to here and kind of reframe it to like almost have a fundamentally different core um, would have been really big. What do you see as the pros and cons of creating a game by yourself? The advantages mostly lie in creative control, singularity of vision. I know what I want even when I am iterating and going against ideas that I thought were locked in or looking for feedback among the community. The end picture, whether or not I can articulate it, is clear in my head and I can always work towards that and spend a little more time on something that I think is interesting or intriguing to me. There's also some uh, other upsides like I really like to work a lot, I really enjoy working a lot, and when I work with someone and throwing out assets, throwing out designs, stuff like just producing very very fast and it's not as fast as they want to be working it kind of ends up feeling bad for both of us even though it's like no one's really at fault 
but you don't have to worry about whether or not you're keeping up with somebody or whether someone's keeping up with you. But I do think aggressive prioritization is a really critical skill. Coming professionally from a background that includes a lot of project management and systems implementation and consulting and stuff like that, I think I've got a pretty well tuned sense of like when you need to break away from something or basically how not to just work on the fun and easy stuff and push the rest off to the side. I mentioned earlier this game started up as a boss battle game and that basically came from a I, I love a boss battle in a game it's one of the most exciting parts of a action type game for me and B I just think that designing them is so interesting and fun and to date about nine eight or nine months into working on this project I've still only made one boss even though that's the main reason I started working on this and the thing that I'm the most excited to do because there's just all these structural systems that need to be worked on first. There's elements of polish and usability for players that needs to go into place. You know, just uh, not letting yourself tackle some stuff that you want to because it's uh, it's not as much of a priority. That uh, is a consequence of prioritizing some other things. Usually this is something you work through with someone else, and you come up with a pipeline that makes sense. Doing it all yourself, there is a unique loop of creation that must take place when you aren't working tied to someone else. When juggling form and function, do you find you tend to lead with one or the other? So I do have some situations where I start off with a need for something. I have a gate. I want there to be a creature that blocks you from going forward until you have a wand. I think that maybe pushing the creature out of the way with the wand is a good idea. No, let's make it a little bit more of an introductory fight. And it eventually evolves into this kind of first mini boss fight just because something felt right to be there and I expanded on it and started from the idea of I need something mechanical that prevents you from going forward until you have demonstrated skill with this uh, combat ability. But on the other side, sometimes it's like, I want to battle on a big bridge. I want to have a big bridge and there's a big battle. Or I want to have you fight two things that work in tandem and they're like partners or something like that. Or I, I want to have you fight a big evil skull. That might be the motivation for me to build all of the things surrounding that rather than the other way. So whatever whatever's gripping and compelling, I just tend to spend more time circling that as form and function grow closer together until it kind of feels like I found the center point. I think one of the biggest benefits of working independently is that I don't have to pick which of those aspects comes first, and I can sort of constantly be in this dance around the two. Surely, there is something that you feel is most lacking in your toolset. What slows you down the most, or is the thing you would most readily hand off to someone else if you were to ever add someone to the team? Background art. <laughs> Character art for me is so engaging. I love designing characters. I love figuring out how to represent certain qualities and really minimal amount of detail that I can get away with. And background art is like, it's like a different language. It's like I don't understand it as art and I don't know what I'm doing and everything looks and feels bad. But you can't, you can't like have a game without a background really unless you're doing something abstract. I think one of the biggest things that I feel kind of, um, you know, disappointed in or like a bit shameful about is like the ground is mostly just a color and there's so many amazing indie games out there being worked on and you scroll through Twitter and it's like these environments are gorgeous, even ones where the art quality is a bit lower, like there's so much fun decorations and things like that. And I could sit there for like three hours trying to figure out how to get a, like a lamp in a corner and hate it the whole time and it, I won't be happy with it and I'll cut it in the end. Making the wall for Peanut Village, it's just a wall. It's like a square wall. It is as simple as it gets. Was hours. <laughs> Now we can tackle the big questions. I combed through websites, Reddit posts, podcasts, interviews, anything I could find, and attempted to pin down what I found to be by far the most commonly asked questions, both for developers and specifically solo devs, coming from people who have never made a game before. How do you get started in game development? Yes, I would say just do it. I think there are so many tutorials, there are so many free quality products. There shouldn't be any financial barriers to game development as long as you have the ability to you know, work consistently on a computer. And I don't really think there's that many skill requirements or like background experience you really need to come in with. I think it's very much something you can learn as you go. And I don't always think that jumping into the deep end is the best way to learn. There's so many ways that different people learn. But I think for a game, second guessing yourself over whether or not you should get started could go on forever. And and the only way you'll really know is if you get started. And games can be small. You could do a game jam that's just 24 hours or a weekend. And that limited scope kind of tells you it's okay for this to be crap in a sense, as long as you are doing it and you get it done and you get some practice making something, even if it is something that you're not happy with. I think that's a, a really great starting point. Even if you're an artist who wants to work with programmers or a musician or something like that, or you're a, a programmer who has done other things and you haven't worked on games and you don't think of yourself as an artist, like join a jam, just throw something out there and it'll give you so much to build on on future things. 
And if your ambition is to make everything yourself, how do you get started as a solo game developer? If your end goal is to do all of it yourself, like I would say do not work on assets, don't work on art, don't work on music. If your goal is to be a solo dev who does all of that, but also does the programming, I think that has to be your starting point and you should use some of the amazing free asset packs that are out there. I've never had any problem with the logic behind programming. I just didn't know any of the languages and thought that it was impenetrable, so I didn't really approach it. Once I did, especially with something like GDScript, which is the Python-based language that Godot uses, but it's, uh, it's very much driven for their engine to make writing code as easy as it needs to be without really any uh, unnecessary syntax. Like I can just write. Once I got familiar with how I need to say what I'm trying to say, I, I mean, I, I program really fast now and I'm quite confident in uh, structures that I'm creating. It's hard to get started. And I think that you know, following one or two tutorials just to know what a starting point even looks like is helpful. But once you're familiar with, you know, this is the syntax, so I need to change this value. This is how I change that value. This is when that happens. After that, it's really, what do I want to happen and why? And what are the considerations for how that has to happen? And you figure out what you want and then you just fit it into the syntax that you need. The main way that I see budding interest in game dev die is when people say like, you know what, I might make a game. I, I kind of want to try making a game. I want to make a platformer and now I'm going to sit down and draw my character and I'm going to draw all the running in it. Oh, and I don't really know how to do running animation. So this is kind of tough. Um, and it just stops you. I think that you absolutely can learn to do all the art yourself and you don't have to worry about whether the art is good. But when you're getting started, that's such a barrier. And what you don't really know is how to create a really good pipeline to create assets quickly. Like I can do slightly better art than Scrap deck like slightly but i picked it because i can do it quickly and consistently and that helps me really pump out assets really fast like, i've had projects die where i felt very competent in doing the art but the sprites took too long because i wasn't good at that style and eventually it was like i need to do another five animals for this animal-based puzzle game and i don't know how to draw a giraffe but a giraffe is part of my design and everything else looks good so if the draft doesn't look good it's going to ruin it and it kind of spirals you out into not working on that for a while which developer has been your biggest source of inspiration? This is tough because my, my genuine answer is I don't know that I have much inspiration as a developer. I just kind of follow my gut and I have fun doing it. The closest thing to inspiration that I, I really have outside of other video games and things like that is my own sense of humor. <laughs> If I can make myself laugh, I usually put it in the game. If I come up with a silly idea and it cracks me up and I think it's stupid, that's usually like, this is what I want to put out to the world. <laughs> there's, a, there's a conversation in the game where there's a very pushy guard that wants you to deal with this um, bully character. And over the course of this fight, they watch you fight, they start shouting, they, they comment on when you're doing badly in a I could have done better sort of way. And right at the end of the fight, they panic and run. You finish this fight, it's a big ending, ba-doom, you get this big reward of, uh, of currency and you finally walk through the gate into the village and there's a celebration going on for this guard peanut who has showed up and and said that they were the one who did the fight and i rub it in your face in a huge way and this idea made me crack up for like two months thinking about it watching people like play through the game and they're like oh great oh it's a little celebration for me hey it's like <laughs> so satisfying and it's so much it's fun for me like I, I love making little jokes like that and having these tiny little story threads that are more or less like just me having fun with this world and I've, I've, I've met some other developer friends through this some really great people some people who I like looked up to their work prior to getting on Twitter and you know we chat about their projects and all around things like that we're kind of all on the same page and that's also been really rewarding I think are really great developers but in terms of like people that i really look up to i would go back to maddie thorson their early work was like well pre-celeste like used to be on like the tig source i think that's what it was called like forums and stuff and those were the best precision platformers that were out there at the time and i still think about an untitled story a lot and how much those really influenced the world design and kind of the way that the story plays out in scrap Dackle. and i had this moment where i was playing celeste and i was like wait i know that name and i was blown away i kind of just lost track i had no idea what they had been working on but it was like whoa i used to follow this person when they were just this kind of young teenage hobbyist and now they're making the best like platformers that are out there that are rightfully acclaimed so absolutely look up to maddie thorson as an idol yeah starting a project is one thing how do you stay motivated yeah i think my motivation is i just like doing it when i am you know excluding like very late at night when i'm i'm tired and looking at my screen it kind of hurts and i've got a headache like working on a game is so rewarding to me i had a week a while ago where 
you know, it's the holidays, and like I just sat down and worked on the game basically straight for a whole week, other than a, a few calls with friends, and I was so happy. <laughs> I was just enjoying myself, like, oh, this is going to be so much fun when people enjoy it. I think the main thing that works against trying to stay motivated is if I don't have anyone to talk with about what I'm up to, I find it's hard for me to keep caring about it. You know, when you <laughs> when you start a Minecraft server with friends and you're all having a good time, and one day you kind of realize you're the only one still logging on, like, it doesn't matter how much fun you've had with that world, it kind of starts being like, does it matter if it's if I'm the only one who kind of knows what I'm up to? Not so much social media like Twitter and Reddit posts and stuff like that, because that's a little bit more like promotional in, in nature. You know, some of the players reached out to me after I set up this demo and were telling me to, to start a Discord server, and I didn't think I really wanted to do it, because I thought it would be like, oh, one more thing to manage, but I went with it, and it's been so rewarding, because you know I've got a channel where I, I post my work as I go, I get some feedback, we do art streams, we joke around about other stuff and um, play games together sometimes. Like it's it's been really rewarding and that's really also been covering that feeling of like I can work on anything and I know that someone is going to know what I'm up to and what's going on and it has external value to someone and I think I struggle when I don't have a clear sense that there is external value to what I'm doing. Doing everything yourself what do your days and weeks look like? On like a day-to-day -day level I am working on whatever it might be a day where I spend most of the day on music and then I sketch something and then I fix a bug it might be a day where I'm working on one enemy start to finish from I kind of sketch out some ideas for how it might move and then I draw it and then I implement that. I might spend an entire day trying to work on like a, a color shader or games architecture or something kind of more back end like that or just drawing art that doesn't even go in the game that's like promotional. One of the real joys for me about working on the game is it, it's like the intersection of all of my creative pursuits and anytime that one starts to burn me out from working on it for too long I can just swap to another and it's refreshing it kind of keeps me like almost constantly engaged and, and recharged. On a week weekly level or a monthly level. When I started working on it, before I thought it was going to be a full project, I was just sort of doing whatever from like a systems up point of view, like, you know, put in an enemy just so I have something to build a combat system around. I was showing my my dev friend roughly once a week, we kind of talk on the weekends, and it turned into like, uh, I'm going to try and get to this milestone before I show him. I'm going to try and get to this milestone before I show him. And over time, that just kind of evolved into organizing it by sprints and figuring out at the start of each week what was going to be in the next sprint and then just rushing to try and get it done. But I, I really like that because it's like you're being a lot more flexible. You know what the priority of things are. You know what the effort of things are. You have a rough idea of all of the tasks involved and you're selecting which ones make the most sense to group together in a very short way and revisiting at the end rather than planning out this whole big thing that might start to fall apart as it meets reality. Once I put the demo public, I kind of shifted to a larger scale approach of that where I'd have an update with a specific focus and I would group together whatever made sense. So Peanut Village was an update, and obviously Peanut Village was in that update, but it also had a lot of the NPC control systems that will let me do other NPC types in the future also being kind of randomly generated and walking around and, and things like that. It had an updated event system that I used for the kind of hint store person in the village. It had a few other things, but like everything that was related to Peanut Village, I kind of grouped together by not just content, but also underlying systems. And uh, that's kind of helped me organize a little bit. I think once I'm finished with demo related work and I just put my head down and start playing plugging away at a full-time game, I'll probably do it something like a big sprint on enemies and bosses for a while, a big sprint on abilities for a while. I, I, I never stick with just one thing for too long. I'll probably cut back and forth a little bit. It's just <laughs> an inevitable part of how I work. Do you still enjoy playing games in your free time? It has honestly been a while since I played much just for fun. I play games with a few friends at kind of consistent times across the week that like are a lot of fun, but I probably wouldn't be doing it just on my own. It's more of like for the social aspect, it's very enjoyable. I do a lot of cooking just as a, a side thing when I need to step away from screens. Uh, I think the only game I've really been playing just to play, just as a single player thing in a long time is uh, I'm, I'm just playing some Factorio. You, you know, you have to think about how your factory works, but I kind of like that I can just turn off my brain and there's this great gameplay loop of a series of small incremental things that are constantly clear what you might need to work on and yeah, just turn off and okay, we need a bit more iron, I'll go get another iron mine. And are there ever any concerns about playing games that share similar genres, mechanics, or anything else in common with Scrabdackle? 
I feel very comfortable with the idea that like games repeat a lot of the same elements and it's not like by intention to ape things, it's just like, hey, you play a top-down game, you're gonna have the same types of attacks and combat, same for like, you know, side scrollers and stuff, and it's much more about the execution for me. You know, I don't look at something and be like, oh, I was gonna do it, but they did it really well. But I don't really play much on my own because it's like, if I'm playing something, I'm not working on the game, and I really want to be working on the game. It, it's a little bit hard to turn off and justify stepping back to not be productive in a way that you know, it's healthy to not always be trying to be productive. But if I'm going to do something like that, I need to have that time set aside in advance so I know that it's, you know, even if it's like a long weekend, I'm not going to do anything productive. Like, I know that's kind of a finite period in my head and I've self-approved it in advance. I will tell you, when Silk Song drops, I'm, I'm shutting my doors for like three days, four days, however long it takes. I'm still blind. I still not watched the trailer. I, I got into the first game blind. I'm going through this one blind. I'm going to love it. Thank you so much to Jake for their detailed answers and for putting up with me for such a lengthy interview, but I think it acts both as this amazing highlight reel of Scrabdackle, as well as this generally applicable insight into someone making a game by themselves. The Scrabdackle Kickstarter is going to be live on March 16th. There's a pre-launch page up. You can check it out. We've got some really exciting rewards for designing your own characters and creatures and boss fights and things like that, uh, as well as some really exciting stretch goals that are all kind of story-based content. We'd love for you to check it out, be notified when the campaign launches. It's going to be something really exciting and special. If you guys couldn't tell, I'm sure it was obvious, this is a pretty heavily chopped up video. Jake and I talked for three hours, and I really cut and reworked the questions to push it along in a more efficient clip. But there was so much cool insight here that I couldn't help but allow it to still be a long video. Hopefully it put into perspective how much work that is. And there's obviously a lot of risk involved. If you want to support Jake and you want to support the world and game of Scrabdackle, the Kickstarter is live on March 16th and will be running for one month. I'll have a link to that down in the description and a pinned comment. Please, please go give that a look. I promise you will not be disappointed. The free demo is already incredible, and that's only a tiny corner of the planned game. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you again soon.